afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion about discovering careers in communications, journalism, and writing. My name is Liz Cook, and I'm with the Career Center here at York. Uh, this panel is co-hosted by uh, the Career Center and Stanley Bethune's Create Your Future series, and the Center for Student Success with uh, LAMPS. So thank you very much for hosting with us. Um, so without further delay, I would like to introduce our panelist, Chris Jai Centeno here, um, and he's an alumnus. He graduated with a BA um, in anthropology. Donna Cope, to Chris's right, um, and Donna is Director of Communications, the Vice Provost of Students at York University. Kim, yes. and um, Kim is Job Evaluation and Pay Equity Officer with the Steelworkers Local um, 1998. Um, she's an alumna with a BA in Women's Studies from 2003. Um, and next to Kim, we have Victoria Shurnam. And um, Victoria is a, an alumnus, or an alumna um, with a BA in History. Um, and she is a children's author, among other things. Um, yeah, hi, my name's Chris. I'm currently, uh, right now, I'm the Associate Editor for Fashion Unlimited magazine. Uh, Canada's new fashion magazine that's actually headed by a York design professor, uh, Paul Sick. Um, uh, it just came out in the newsstands, I believe, New Year's Day, so if you guys want to check that out, it's in chapters. Um, but a little bit about me, I've pretty much worked in all aspects of media. I've worked online, newspapers, a newswire, radio, and television, both news and entertainment as well. So, um, sorry, what was your question again? Just describe your role with um, you. Uh, yeah, uh, as an associate editor for the fashion magazine, I'm pretty much, you know, um, coordinating shoots, writing articles, editing, writing docs, headlines, um, and sometimes go to parties, so. I'm Donna. I'm the director of communications for the vice provost students, the division there. Um, my responsibilities uh, encompass everything from communications for recruitment all the way through to, um, to graduation. So we have a, I have a team at, uh, in, the, in the division, and we look after prospective students, communications, current students, um, and then very briefly, we also talk to alumni. Um, my responsibilities are basically strategy, uh, so I develop the strategy, integrated campaigns, um, but I also do writing, editing, um, I work in social media, new media, so my toolkit is pretty varied, um, and I've been in communications now for about 30 years, so, and I've done a variety of things. Um, I'm Kim Walker, and I work for Steelworkers Local 1998. We represent staff, administrative and technical staff, at the University of Toronto. Um, we are a member-driven organization. We represent our membership, which is largely women, 70% women at U of T. So, um, so, the issues that we deal with are very pertinent to that fact that we are 70% females at the University of Toronto. Um, so as a member-driven organization, there were various initiatives that I've been involved in over the years. Administration, um, more currently I've been involved in the uh, Job Evaluation and Pay Equity Project, which is actually the largest job evaluation um, project in North American history. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a large project, it's complex, and the goal of that project is that people are going to be compensated fairly for the work that they're doing. Um, a lot of writing goes into that, submissions um, to arbitrators, um, uh, negotiating, there are different aspects that are involved with that, engaging with their members to make sure that they are educated and aware of the issues that are at play in the processes. Um, that they can go through to make sure that their job has been equitably and fairly assessed and is compensated for um, fairly. Um, I'm also involved in uh, communications campaigns. Um, those are driven by the needs of our membership as well as the times, the socioeconomic climate, um, uh, and any trends that just become apparent to us. Uh, our most recent campaign was around workplace bullying and harassment, um, so that's uh, coming from a place where we're, we're trying to engage our membership and empower them so that they have tools so they can deal with uh, workplace issues that they're experiencing. I also coordinate the newsletter. I come up with content um, for that. Um, and I'm involved in all sorts of aspects of that, editing, writing, um, production. Um, yeah, so a lot of different areas. Okay. 
My name is uh, Victoria Sherham. I'm a self-published uh, children's author and illustrator. I'm also studying to become a teacher, so I'm in my last year of that. Uh, primary and junior is the level that I'm teaching, uh, but I also, I've done children's books since I was young. I've always had an interest in them and reading them and in trying to write them myself. And in the past number of years, I've been seriously doing that. I've been writing and illustrating, and after a lot of research and a number of years kind of looking into different things, I decided to self-publish. And that's where I came up with Join in Press, which is my own publication for my books. Um, website designing, marketing, uh, because I'm self-published, I wear many hats while I'm doing this, and I love doing it. It's a way of doing uh, my creative art, as well as kind of blending my love of education and teaching children with basically books and writing, and it brings everything all together, and I absolutely love doing it. And it's something I'm still growing with, it's something I still learn and uh, grow from every time I write a book or read a book to a child and I develop uh, stories as I go along, numerous ideas, so it's just something I keep growing with and I absolutely love doing it. What, what brought you to where you are today? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges as a student at York University especially is sort of like gaining work experience while you're still a student. Um, so for me, what I did was basically um, volunteer for a lot of different campus organizations such as CHRY, which was, I don't know if anyone knows CHRY, mm -hmm. the radio station at York University. If you guys don't, please go, because they actually have a lot of really good initiatives, as well as um, working at Excalibur, which is uh, York University's student newspaper. Um, I, when I was younger, I've always wanted to become sort of a journalist, but um, you know, I, I didn't want to go to Ottawa, um, who wants to go to Ottawa? It's, it's such a boring <laughs> city after living there, no offense. But um, uh, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna do communications as well as anthropology here at York University. Um, but from then on, I pretty much you know, uh, got small internships working for iWeekly and for a few uh, magazines. And then working my way up in terms of getting uh, the bigger internships like the Toronto Star, like the uh, Global uh, TV. Um, and yeah, pretty much from then on, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, work my way up, you know, gain different skills, working as a writer, as an editor, as a copy editor, um, as, a, as an editorial assistant, as well as a producer in the end, so, yeah. Um, I, I guess you could say I came to this um, discipline pretty much through a back door, because my initial, when I went to university in 1981 first, I went to do a BSc, and then, uh, the fam my family situation changed and I needed to leave university and get a job. So what I started working in at that time was in retail, but doing retail training. So I went along and, and that provided me with a good career at the time. And then I was offered a job swap. Somebody said to me, you know, I really would like to do training and how about you switch with me and you do communications. And since the skill set for the two are quite similar, I thought, ooh, this would be a great thing to do. So I did. And I spent the next few years working in communications and building my skills there. I worked for the Body Shop Canada, and I started off, again, in the training area, worked my way into communications coordination, and then was, when I left that position, I was the manager of communications for the Body Shop Canada. So it provided me with a lot of opportunity, and it also, it also helped me build my networking, because I met a lot of people working on the floor of some of the shops, which each of us in the company had to do. That was part of what we, our responsibilities were. And then I thought to myself, I never did finish my degree. Why don't I go back and finish my degree? So I enrolled at York, um, and then I went freelance. So I decided that, okay, so if I am going to be finishing my degree, I'll do some freelancing. And I found that even though it was very lucrative, what I was doing was helping students complete their theses and their dissertations, so edit their theses and dissertations, um, and also help submit um, applications to graduate schools. That paid a lot of the bills. Um, but I found that I was not cut out for freelancing. Uh, it was not something that I enjoyed. I didn't like being alone for all that amount of time. I also didn't like working on linear projects, going from one to one to one. I found that I really liked to mix it up and work on many projects at the same time because there was a good synergy and you could, you could really bring information from one to the other. So I thought, okay, no more freelancing. So what can I do? I looked around and I thought, hmm, I wonder what it would be like to work in a university. So I applied as a work-study student. 
the, the two things were overlapping at the time. And I actually worked in this building as a work-study student. Um, I did that for a while, and then I applied to come on board full-time. And I worked my way up through a variety of positions. I did everything from new media, which meant I was coding websites, to writing and researching um, in the same area, all to do with admissions and recruitment at the time. And then I decided to cast my, my net a little bit wider, and I moved up into an associate director's position looking after staff who were doing websites and writing and generating content and doing communication work for admissions and recruitment. And gradually um, increased my portfolio, and the university, I moved up in the university at the same time. So from not being all that interested in doing communications work, um, to being very, very pleased and, and excited about the work that I do because I work and interact with students a lot. Um, we interact online and social media. So I have a team and if, you're in, if you are interacting at all with at York University, that's my area and my team um, that are responding to you. So that's, that's my journey. That's where I've come. Okay, so... Um, it's funny because only recently I realized that what I'm doing over the last four years really does coincide with what I studied because I majored in women's studies here at York. Great program. Um, and of course writing is a big part of that, doing a BA, we all learn to write. Um, I also worked as uh, the editor-in-chief of the Atkinsonian, which used to be a monthly community news magazine <clears throat> for Atkinson College right here. I used to work across the hall basically in a renovated bathroom. That was our office. Um, but um, yeah, so I also got some other experience that was very valuable for me when I did um, end up applying to a position at the Steelworkers. I used to work here at um, Atkinson College um, uh, through work-study funding and got some experience helping with convocation and different things and in different administrative um, support uh, in the work-study role. Um, but my career did not have a straight path at all. Um, I was a student activist, um, so in a sense that tied in with my um, my application to the steelworkers. I was very, I, I was raised in a union friendly family, a family of union activists. Social issues were always very important. We would have lots of conversations always about what was happening in the world. Um, so it was always part of my consciousness. And when I applied to steel, that definitely that work that I did because I just believed in it and I was passionate about it, that helped get me um, in the door effectively. But uh, my family situation did change, as Carol <laughs> alluded to with her, that that was her case. I actually got pregnant when I was still um, working on, toward my degree here at York. So suddenly I had to get a job, had to fast track through finishing my degree, um, and had to get work to support myself and my daughter. I was a single mom for a few years. Um, so that was part of my path. So starting to work at Steele, it was, a, it was mainly administrative work and reception in the beginning, although they knew that I had, you know, skills related to putting out a newsletter, and they were eager to use that, so I started producing their newsletter, any print media that they needed. Um, I find those skills are actually very, um, very important right now in the workplace. We see administrative work changing a lot. Um, administrative positions are not what they used to be. Um, people often end up playing dual or triple roles in their functions, and communications can often play a part in that. We see a lot of people maintaining websites and putting out newsletters and coming up with strategic content for their community or their office. Um, yeah, and then a few years ago, I indicated probably about five years ago that I was interested in helping out with the job evaluation and pay equity project. And it just started with me doing some administrative support functions to now being um, a key member of the team um, and helping to, to shape the direction of the project. So I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. And I really love the work that I do because we can see that it really benefits people. So um, I got started from when I was really young. I love, as I said before, I love children's books. And I actually started with a small character. I called him JD, and he had his dog Max. And when I was about five or six, I came up with this character, and I started writing little children's books. And they were something simple. It was like JD and Max learned to count to 10, you know, the things that a small primary child would write about. 
And I started doing that a lot more, and I just kept doing it in my spare time. And if a teacher had an assignment that I could do a children's book or do a story in some way, I would jump on that opportunity, and I'd do that. And I did that right from elementary school to high school, right up, and uh, university, and I was busy in that. And in my first year of education, uh, but four or five years ago, I had a professor and she did an assignment and she said, you know, you could do this any way you wish. And so I decided I'll do a children's book. And I hadn't really done, I've been keeping up with my art and my writing, but I've not done a serious children's book in a long time. And I did this book, handed it in, and when she gave it back to me, she said, if you ever get this published, I want a signed copy. And it started me thinking that, okay, maybe I could pick this up again. And so I started doing my writing again, doing my drawing and blending them in children's stories again. And I work with kids as a, becoming a teacher, and a, my mom was a teacher as well, and kindergarten teacher. So during that summer, I wrote a story, um, Auntie Leah uh, Babysits a Zoo. And I wrote this story, and I read it to as many people as I could. I read it to my parents. I read it to family, friends. And then I went into my mom's class, and I read it to her kids, and I read it to a whole bunch of kids. And I got phenomenal feedback, really good feedback. And I was thrilled. I thought, this is great, and I want to actually do something with it. So it's not going to go in the drawer like the J.D. and Max books. It's going to actually do something. Because I really believed in it, and I thought, this is something that I love to do, I'm passionate about, and I want to do it. So I looked into it. I did a lot of research. I went to the Children's Book Center uh, in Toronto, and I talked to a lady there, and I spoke to a, actually a family friend of ours who is into writing and into publishing, and he directed me there. He said, they'll have great resources, and they really do. So I went there. I spoke to a woman there, and I said, this is what I want to do. This is my book. Um, I've got some great ideas. I want to be an author and illustrator of children's stories. And she looked at me like, you poor child, you don't know what you're getting into. Because I later found out with more research that being an author and an illustrator at the same time is incredibly difficult. You have to get your foot in the door as an author until you can work your way up to be an illustrator. So more and more research later, and I at this point wrote about two, three, four more books. I just keep writing because I love doing it. And at that point, um, I decided I'm going to do self-publishing. And so I looked more into it. I'd done different business things in the past uh, on the side and that with uh, Government of Ontario. They sponsored students to do business ideas. And I did things with my art and I thought, I can do this. And my dad has a good business background. And so I asked him for some guidance on it. And I spoke to different people. And it just slowly grew into Join and Press. And um, I love it because I have some self-control of what I'm doing, what I'm publishing, what I'm designing. But at the same time, it's wearing a lot of hats. But I love that. I love that balance. And uh, it's something that I've continued to grow in. But that's kind of how I started in doing it. I started small when I was really young and just kept building from there. Uh, for current students, what advice you would have for what they can start doing right now uh, to start developing their careers? Get out now. You try. You look for things. Um, definitely pester professors or you get information where you can. Um, it's a great time. I know it's busy. I definitely know it's busy between essays and work and extracurricular activities. It is very busy. But it'll pay off. And if you push it and you try to find things and you do a lot of research now, it pays off in the future. So I found that I basically spent a good chunk of my time with uh, self-publishing and trying to get into that researching and talking to people, talking to people at university, uh, getting involved in events at the university where I spoke about my books or spoke to people who were self-publishing, got ideas from them because it is a great resource. You have so many people at your fingertips in one place that are doing diverse things. And, and diverse fields that you can talk to them. So it's a great thing to start now. And just general research. Um, I mean, it's, it's, as I said, it's a busy time, but it's a great time to start reaching out and looking for things. And also, if you're writing, if you're um, illustrating as well, it's a good time to keep practicing. So keep up the practice of it. And if you have a spare moment, try to write something. Um, I did that the same. If I you know, had a spare moment on the bus or the, the subway coming home and I got an idea, I'd jot it down and I'd start writing even just some ideas. I may not have a full story. I've got so many ideas on my computer. They're just kind of half stories. But when I get that moment that I can sit down and fully write them out, I will because they're going to be there. So it's that time where you can develop stories and start developing where you want to go in your career when you have that uh, opportunity in that time. And you never know when you start researching what opportunities will basically present themselves while you're looking. So yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. You never know, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, basically, I think you can consider 
things that come your way as being learning opportunities, right? So it is hard, it's yeah. busy, it's difficult. You know, tuition costs a lot more than it used to, so students have to work a lot of the time. So they're even more pressed for their time and their energy, right? Um, but I guess the one thing that I found was was very instrumental in me building skills while being here, aside from my degree and learning how to write well and connecting with good profs and people with good ideas, was working at the student paper. Like really, it teaches you so many different skills from time management to project management and planning, timelines, writing, editing, being able to make quick decisions when something's got to go to print, um, you know, being creative and coming up with ideas, being plugged into your community and what's going on, right? Those are the, you know, what I think of as the hallmarks of someone who's, you know, an active, engaged citizen, right? The kind of person that most of us want to be, right? Um, and uh, if I hadn't have done that, if I hadn't have been, you know, active and spending my time at the Atkinsonian and gathering those skills and learning those skills by doing it, kind of just being thrown into it, um, I would have missed out on a lot of opportunities. So I would advocate um, volunteer work with any sort of media um, media organization, that's XCAL, CHRY, um, or any organizations on campus. There are a lot of organizations doing really, really good work. I don't know if OPERG's still here. Um, anyway, there, there are a lot of good organizations. The Women's Center, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Is the OPERG? Yes, I don't know. Cool. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Along those lines, um, um, if you were interested more in, say, corporate communication or internal communication, then now's the time to start getting involved with your associations because many of them have student streams. So I'm thinking along the lines of the IABC, the International Association of Business Communicators. I'm thinking of Professional Writers of Canada, um, at the Editors Association of Canada. There are a number of groups like that that are definitely looking for and have the ability to mentor and help students along in their, in their student streams. They offer seminars, they offer workshops um, that in many cases are either free or have a reduced fee for students. So, um, and while you're there, you're also networking with people who are working in the industry that you're interested in. Um, so cast your net wide and think of organizations that you might want to be, in, you might have an interest in that are not media related. So spread, spread yourself around. Um, yes, definitely magazines, newspapers, online and offline, but then there are organizations that are interested in people who have writing skills, editing skills, interviewing, synthesizing skills that are not necessarily attached to media, but they have huge communications mm -hmm. departments that are looking for uh, students who are skilled. You can look for a mentor there or do internships, as we have said. Um, you also need to look at your online presence. So you need to make sure that who you are online is uh, presenting the best and most accurate face because that's where employers go to look. I mean, that if anyone apl impl uh, applies to my unit, that's one of the first places I go. Um, so also, uh, you need to probably make sure that your toolkit, the thing that you do that you're going to sell, whether it be your writing or your photography or whether it be videography, um, is at the peak condition. So while you're at school, you have the best opportunity to take those skills and write a variety of things for all your classes. And you can probably leverage that by taking some of your writing samples to some of the associations or organizations that may be interested in it. Um, and then you can ask someone there to critique it, um, give you an idea of whether it would fly in their organization or not, um, and then take it from there. You have already, you built a relationship there, you can leverage that and network that going forward. So while you're here and you're, you're in your classes, you can also um, look around to some of your professors who are involved in organizations that are outside the university as well. Cool. Um, I pretty much echo a lot of uh, what the panelists have said. Um, firstly, we talked about kind of um, being involved in a student organization. Um, I think I was really lucky enough to be a part of that. I felt like that was sort of like my journalism degree instead of going to journalism school. Um, and you know, one of my first internships actually was working at FQ, um, 
where I pretty much just, you know, uh, did a database of all the magazines and the newspapers that I wanted to work for, call, cold call them, because a lot of the internships basically are not posted or published, uh, made friends with a receptionist who became kind of like my best friends, because they knew anything, the ins and outs of the office, right? People schedules, you know, when they check their emails, all that stuff, and pretty much wrangled my way into getting um, uh, a coffee meeting with uh, the executive editor then that landed me an internship. Um, <clears throat> someone also mentioned organizations. You mentioned organizations. When I was, when I was part of um, York, I was also, I sat on the board of the Canadian Association of Journalists, and CAJ actually had a lot of uh, free seminars for students, um, but I think now, I think it costs like maybe five or 10 bucks, where you can attend sort of like a news writing panel, a media panel, an internship panel to learn more about, you know, how people can get internships. Um, networking is definitely one of them. Um, you know, if you kind of don't really know who the players are in this industry or who the hiring managers or editors are, it's, it's going to be really hard to actually get hired in a magazine or a newspaper. Um, uh, someone also mentioned freelancing. So I think um, uh, a good way to kind of like leverage a job or an internship is getting clips. You can start doing that by, you know, working for your student newspaper, uh, trying your hand at freelancing um, or pitching to, you know, newspapers or magazines. It's not just, you know, the Toronto Stars, Globe and Mail, the National Post, or all the big major magazines out there that are actually looking for writers. Um, there's also periodicals out there as well as, um, you know, things like car magazines, for instance, you know, um, that actually pay a lot more than a lot of these media um, or these major media organizations. Um, learning new skills is also um, really important. Um, for me, when I was younger, I've always wanted to become a reporter. Um, but when I applied for post media for a reporter position, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they actually didn't even take me. But they um, they had another posting for an online editor position, which I interviewed for anyway. Um, but I was kind of like, uh, online isn't really my thing. I'm more in, I'm more interested in writing than anything else. But um, after getting hired, I figured out that you know what, it's actually. It was a different way of telling a story. It's not just through photos or through text, but you can do it through videos, you can do it through timelines, you can do it through mapping, you can do it in many different things. Um, so I think you know, putting yourself um, uh, at the top of, uh, say, like a, the hiring pile, um, new skills such as coding, websites, for instance, you know, learning more about social media, which I'm pretty sure you guys are involved in. Um, and I think the last suggestion that I have is reading books and magazines. No one ever reads books or newspapers or magazines anymore, but basically being in the know of what's happening uh, presently out there is actually really important. So, Great point. I get a lot of students um, coming out of communications who are quite interested in doing a master's degree, but they're not sure, you know, do, a, do you need the master's to get into this field? Should you have a master's? Are you at a strategic advantage with a master's? Or should I be out just getting experience, not worrying about grad school? In your experience, what's your take on it? What would your advice be to a friend in the same situation? Um, I'm open to what you'd have to say on this. Um, I'm actually applying for a master's <laughs> position, right, uh, master's uh, uh, program right now. but. Um, to be honest with you, I, I feel like there's there's two um, school of thoughts when it comes to getting a master's and kind of like getting your your foot in the door. Um, you know, uh, there's there's a few people who pretty much um, after graduating they um, they end up taking a master's um, because it's a foot in the door. But unfortunately, that's not the only way to actually get into um, working for a magazine or a newspaper. Um, one of them is through internships and freelancing. Um, however, I feel like like one of my uh, when I was, I think, my fourth year here, I landed the Toronto Star internship, which was one of the coveted internships um, for, you know, for a young journalist. And I felt kind of out of place um, there because I felt like, oh, wow, here I am working for CHRY and, like, Excalibur and, like, getting, you know, writing for the Toronto Star, when a lot of the other interns there have done war reporting in Afghanistan, have worked for Globe and Mail, National Post, you know, and other major networks. Um, but uh, I think holding off to do a master's, would, in my opinion, I think holding off to do a master's and getting, you know, gaining more of the work experience is a little bit more um, succinct than, say, having a master's. I think 
a lot of people can write, a lot of people can edit, a lot of people have masters, but if you don't have the proper tools, then a masters won't help you, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a master's degree. I have a master's in English. Um, and my specialization was Anglo-Saxon and Old English. So not very helpful to my immediately, or you wouldn't think that it was. But having that master's degree has given me the opportunity to work with professors who are in that field, who need research, who need me to help with, assist with writing. So it all depends on what your master's is in. Um, and it also depends on what it is that you have down the road in your future, like what have you, if you've thought that far. So reporting and, and working in a very fast-paced environment um, is great. Uh, sometimes if you have a family or sometimes if your, your, your situation changes at home, you probably can't do that forever. So you need to think forward what, is it, what it is that you're going to do within, in your 40s and your 50s. And sometimes it's your degree, whether it be your BA or your master's degree, that can provide you with an alternative frame um, within which to work. So whether you, work, you go into that area and you write, or you go into that area and become a subject matter expert, um, it's all within communications and you're all still leveraging your toolkit, which is writing, editing, researching, etc but you've given yourself a little bit more of a future forward uh, plan. Maybe this isn't fair to say, but I would say both. <laughs> Experience <laughs> and a master's yes. ideally. Yes. I've been toying with the idea of getting a master's for the last few years. I think it's going to wait a few more years because I have another young child. I have, I have children and it's just, it's, it's a lot, right? If you love your job and you work hard and we tend to put in more time than we really even need to because, you know, if you love your job, that's what you do, right? And you're passionate about it and you care about the outcomes, right? Um, and then I also love my family and I love my children and I want to spend time with them. So um, for me, the idea of getting a master's and continuing my education, it falls in line with, with what you were describing, Carol. About, oh, sorry, Donna. Donna. I've called you Carol twice. Okay. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Donna, <laughs> what you were describing about, you know, um, maybe shifting your focus at different times, right? So I would keep on working and then um, pursue probably a part time master's in maybe two years' time when I have more sleep every day. <laughs> so my question, any of you guys can take the phone, would be how do you guys stay motivated? Sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'll wake up six in the morning and, you know, push and want to do work all the time and sometimes be like I'll do it tomorrow. I agree it's the constant push to do better it's um, because uh, I do self-publication I'm not I don't have those deadlines so it's it's more like you've just you've got to find that motivation and there are definitely days where I will write down an idea and look at it and go I really don't know where I can take this right now um, and I put it aside till I feel motivated till I feel ready that I can pick this up again mm -hmm. so there definitely are days and people experience that all the time and it's 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 rough to try to constantly keep yourself motivated but I think one of the things that keeps me motivated and keeps me going is um, I really am passionate about what I do I love to draw I love to write and that passion does keep me going because it's just something I want to keep getting better I want to keep pushing keep getting what I want to do out there and also the feedback. Um, when I get feedback, if I read a story to a class of kids and they turn around and they start making their own books. Um, recently, somebody, uh, my, a co-worker of my dad, he gave him a, a, one of my children's books and his, uh, he makes the Halloween costumes for his son. And the son turned around and said, okay, dad, I want this for my Halloween costume to, this year. And it was the dinosaur on the cover of my book and turned around and that was this, this uh, five-year-old boy's Halloween costume was something out of one of my books and that was a fantastic motivator for me because that was a, an incredible feedback. It was something that I started or I inspired and just to keep inspiring that way is a big, big motivation for me to keep writing, to keep going and it gets me through those days when I think I really don't have an idea for this, I don't have a character in my head for this story and it gets me over those hurdles to kind of push past it for me. So flowing from that, definitely, um, if it's linked to something that you're passionate about, you're still going to have your waxes and your waning, you know, you're going to have fluctuations. I have days where, yes, my brain is also off, right? That does happen. But you still probably function better than you think you are. You probably are your worst critic, right? When you think that your brain's off, you're still functioning. You're still, 
doing what you should do and what you need to do. I guess for me, it's it ties in with my passion. I see the outcomes directly, like we see it as a team, right? Um, it could manifest in the way of someone's uh, workplace um, conditions improving significantly. It could manifest in retroactive salary adjustments, which come through for women who have worked for years and years at the university, and now the university agrees and sees because of our arguments and our writing and our analysis that they were undervalued and underpaid for those years, and then they get that payment, right? And then it's great to get that feedback from people and see that implemented. Um, so those outcomes motivate me um, to keep going all the time. I'm lucky that I love what I'm doing. It sounds like we all do, <laughs> right? But yeah, I, I consider myself very lucky and that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm in a little bit of a different position um, insofar as what motivates me is seeing some of my, any of the people that I mentor or any of my staff um, leaving, right? So if they work with me for a while and I've mentored them and helped them build their skills and make connections and, and do the things that they really want to do, what motivates me is if they make the jump and they end up where they want to be. So along with my day-to-day stuff that I'm doing, which is writing and editing and looking after the strategic communication for the division, I'm also working with my team to make sure that that kind of thing can happen. So that adds a little bit of sparkle to my day, almost every day, and it's different. And that, that's, a, that's motivating, it's also personally fulfilling, um, and it's a little bit counterintuitive because no manager wants their staff to leave because then you're left with a position. But that's also an opportunity because then you can bring in another person with another set of skills with a different viewpoint that is another opportunity for you to help and to mentor along. Um, oh, it's actually really hard for me to stay motivated. That's why I can never do freelance. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, finding, finding um, what you're passionate about is really, really important. I think that's what motivates you. Um, and I know this may sound a little bit superficial, but um, for me, pride is sort of like a, a motivator for me. You know, doing a really good, like, say you're writing a, a thousand or two thousand word article, right? And then by the end of it, um, knowing that that article is going to be in the front page of a newspaper or a segment for a TV show, um, that is actually what motivates me. So, doing really good work. Um, so you're all in careers that that um, are potentially romanticized a lot of the time. So I'm I'm interested in some of the challenges that you face in, in each of your roles. You might think of a lot of people at the time may pick up a child's book and go, oh, it's it's something simple, it rhymes. Um, it's like child's play to write, and that's not necessarily the truth because, you know, it may seem simple, and that's the whole idea is to make it effortless because you want eventually for a six-year-old or a five-year-old to read it themselves. But you have so many things you have to take into account. You have to take into account language. Uh, what language are you using? Is it going to be at the level of that child? Is it going to be entertaining for that child to sit there and listen to this book being read to them or eventually read the book for themselves? Um, if you're illustrating, it's the same thing. Are those illustrations going to be captivating to the, the child that's going to be looking at it? So it, it is very difficult. It's a very difficult field to get into if you want to be published by one of the big publishing houses. It's, um, it's not easy, and if you do submit your manuscript, if everything works out, uh, they get thousands of manuscripts in a year annually, and they only produce maybe one out of ten of those. So your manuscript has to be really strong, really well polished. Uh, to be to actually taken and at the same time as soon as that happens you have people editing it you have people going through it you have art directors you have endless cycles of things that are going to have their hand in on this it, different ideas different people uh, are going to be trying to fix it and make it better and that much more marketable because it is at the same time as it's fun it's artistic it's also it's a business they have to make money a publishing house has to make money if you're self-published you have to also make money um, so it's it's fun, it's entertaining, it's engaging to actually be writing these things and you get really involved with it and as I said before it's a passion uh, and it's definitely worthwhile, it's worth all that effort um, in doing but it's again it's, it's not easy as it sometimes may appear as I said you have to make it look effortless but there's a lot of work that goes behind that, a lot of creativity, a lot of time, 
a lot of ideas that are scrapped because if you read it to a group of kids, and that's one of the biggest things I say, you sit down and you read it to children because they're your audience, they're your market. If they have no interest, if they spill their popcorn and start engaging with the popcorn and not your book, maybe something you have to start tweaking in that just to keep that engagement up because a teacher is going to be sitting in a classroom with 20 children in front of them and they're going to be you know wanting those children to be engaged or to make lessons out of that so there's a lot that goes into thinking about it so it may seem simple but there's so much going on behind it so I think that's that's one of the things that in children's book writing that's that's a big thing um. So my work is a little bit different. There definitely are communications elements, and I, I definitely write articles and do research and write copy and edit, um, but and then also make you know submissions you know based on analysis and arguments that we've prepared right for an arbitrator to review. Um, so there's definitely writing, but it's a different um, experience for me, um, not being a journalist or. Um, Primarily, I guess for me, my biggest challenge would be um, misinformation. So when there's misinformation out there about the process, so people, um, they, let's just say sometimes there's a lack of consistency with how, um, how information is distributed through HR professionals at U of T sometimes, and then um, what ends up happening is, um, and that's the administration, but what ends up happening is that people will come to us with misinformation and then we have to clarify about the process. Um, sometimes people um, will have had the runaround about reclassifying their position for a long time. So by the time they get to us, they're upset because they feel, you know, that um, they should have been paid at a different level for that period of time. Um, so that's probably one of my biggest challenges. Also the emotional piece, you know. Um, we deal with, there are many overlaps of different issues that we deal with. And, um, you know, you want to fix it for people right away, right? So it's like you're on that path, you know it's going to be addressed and you know that you're going to take care of it, but sometimes the emotional piece and seeing people suffering, you know, sometimes that can be really hard. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. the I don't really know how you can romanticize working in a corporate communications area. Um, <laughs> my, well, mm, no. Um, but the biggest challenge is balancing creativity with institutional um, directive. And by that I mean messaging at a university like, like York comes down through many layers. So what ends up in an admissions handbook has been vetted by 60 people or so. So maintaining that creative edge and something that would be interesting to someone who is 17 years old is very difficult. You need to tap dance Im incredibly. So the freedom, and I'm using freedom perhaps in quotation marks that Ennio perhaps has in his position, we don't have or we don't have the same degree. So if you're writing and you want it to be engaging and you want it to be creative, then you really need to learn to work within the system, which is another skill, basically, that you have to learn uh, through trial and error and lots of um, blind alleys and fits and starts. But on the other hand, when you do have a product or when you have created a piece of writing or if there is a tagline or if there is something, a photo or a video that has been produced that really hits its mark, then it makes everything all worthwhile. All the hoops that you have to jump through and all the 60 people that have to see that one or two lines of text, is it's worth it for sure. Um, I think working in, uh, like say a big market um, media organization, I think having a work-life balance is pretty much non-existent. Um, we had a joke when I was working at uh, Post Media that, you know, other journalists are pretty much married to other journalists because you're working 10, 12 hour days and the only people you see in the field are pretty much other journalists, so, which kind of sucks. Um, but, you know, fine, you kind of like, it's, it's a high stressful job, right, where you're mostly working a lot. So, um, yeah, relaxing is, is a little bit important. Um, but so I, I think you mentioned also kind of like distancing yourself and like emotions. 
Um, one of the first jobs that I did was pretty much crime reporting, and you're talking mm. to, oh my god, you're talking to like, you know, relatives of dead people, right, who were gunned down or like were stabbed to death. Um, and, you know, for them to actually sit down with you and trust you to come into their homes to tell you about the stories that they've actually, about their son or about their daughter, is actually really, really hard. Um, so kind of like distancing yourself um, with that is, uh, it becomes a skill. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, you kind of like, you kind of just remember, you kind of just remember, kind of remember the work that you actually do, which is informing the public and letting these people uh, tell their stories through your eyes and through your writing. So, yeah. Internship, yeah. I think it's actually really hard um, because when you're competing with so many interns, as well as when you're competing with you know uh, people who have many different experiences, um, it it really is hard. But um, also, uh, unfortunately, in Canada, right, compared to the states, the you know the magazine, the newspaper, the media pool here isn't quite as big as say like it is in England or in the states. So. I feel like you really, really have to hustle. Um, and I think, you know, Elio actually mentioned, you know, it, that he can call up an editor um, or, you know, someone else, if, especially if they're hiring. That's actually quite true. Uh, the last two jobs that I, that, I, that I have had, I was actually lucky enough not to even apply for those, right? Um, it was mostly through word of mouth and through people that I, that I know of. So I think, you know, kind of like, if you do a good job at your internship, right, if you have like really, really good clips, I think that's going to be your passport in getting, you know, a job there at, the, at that magazine or getting another job at another magazine. So, yeah. But you know what? Just keep going. Keep going, going. I have a question about for the journalists that are, I know you guys write for different platforms and it's obviously different writing for print, writing for online. Uh, now that you're in the industry, what do you do to sort of sharpen your writing skills uh, across all the different platforms? Um, I think there's a lot of organizations like Canadian Association of Journalists that actually have like say like a writing seminar like a news or a feature writing seminar you can definitely attend those especially if you have a student ID like I think it's discounted um, that's actually a really hard question to answer for me I would say practice makes perfect right the more you actually do it the more you'll become better at it um, uh, before working for a broadcast station I mostly worked in magazines and newspapers and um, unfortunately, at Excalibur, you know, it's pretty much, for me, when I was working at Excal, you know, all I really wanted was a Toronto Star internship. It was such a tunnel vision in terms of, you know, of, of, of newspapers, really. But little did I know that, oh, there's actually a radio station that you can work for. There's TV stations you can work for, right? Or even alternative weeklies that you can, that you can work for than just the newspaper stream. Um, and when I actually, I think my first few days at Global, you know, um, one of my, um, Producers were like, oh, can you write this small brief about, I don't know, some crime or some fatality that happened, right? So when I actually wrote it, it was, it was very wordy because coming from a newspaper background, you know, you pretty much have all the information that you need, right? And you kind of give it to them and, you know, someone edit, edits it. But unfortunately, my producer was like, you know, this is not, this is like too newspaper right? Like, and in TV, you have to write um, with a, obviously with an authority, but it has to be, you have to write for the lowest common denominator. So, you know, like a, a nine-year-old watching the news compared to like a 79-year-old watching the news, they have to have the same takeaway um, when, whenever they're actually, you know, watching that particular segment or news piece. So, but I would say honestly, just practice, 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 practice. So, um, when I was at the Star, when I was when I was getting my internship at the Star, um, it mostly dealt with crime reporting. That's where the interns pretty much start. So for me, what I did was, you know, I consumed as many crime stories as I could, and pretty much uh, gotten police press releases, and spent two hours writing, you know, my crime stories. And it's so that my first day, I knew what was expected of me, and I knew what kind of work um, that I was capable of. So. Donna, you write across platforms as well, right? There's a, an online component to mm -hmm. the university's communications. Do you have any advice as well? The, the main thing that we, that, that we focus on when we're writing across platforms is how will we get the information across 
as quickly and succinctly as we possibly can without losing the main storyline. Um, so if we're, if we're producing, if a campaign is being launched and we're going to be talking to the whole entire university community and we have five platforms that we're doing it on, so we're doing it on social media, we do a blog, we put something on the website, perhaps we maybe produce a video and we do a photo, a photo spread. So how do we make sure that the messaging is consistent across all of those? And if we, if we can, how do we bring creativity to all of those and make it hang together? Um, that's mostly what we're looking at and what we consider. We don't, right, the, the, the industry has changed a lot since I first started. What we started to generate was copy, right? So, but now we don't generate copy, we, we generate content. Mm -hmm. So each piece of content that we're creating has to be applicable across all platforms regardless. So we don't think of, we're not starting with the tactic in other words, you start with the audience and the message and then you just make sure that your messaging is consistent um, and you're not, you're not really thinking about, oh I'm producing this for a tweet or I'm producing this for a blog. I'm producing something so that I can make it understandable to my audience and, make the, and ha help them take action, right, if, if that's so.